all the craziest moonshots from Facebook's F8 conference. Find out if you are healthy enough for Google's baseline project and learn to code to protect yourself from the oncoming robot apocalypse. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1750, recorded Wednesday, April 19th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, work with one that has your best interest in mind. Use Rocket Mortgage for a transparent, trustworthy home loan process that's completely online at quickenloans.com slash TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we tell you everything you need to know about technology. I'm Megan Maroney. And I'm Nathan Olivares-Giles, filling in for Jason Howell. Yep, he is out for a couple of days on a little vacay, but I think we've got this covered. Yeah, I think we got this. I mm -hmm. think we've got this. This is going to be a great episode, and we're going to start off talking about Facebook's F8 Developer Conference. Day two kicked off today with a company keynote presentation that was focused on the futuristic technologies that Facebook is working on. It's all a lot of stuff that's basically at least a few years off. Facebook has a division called Building 8, which works on experimental and further off technologies. And, and they said that all of this is really kind of about building the future of technology. And Facebook thinks it has a good vision for where it's all going. Now, one of the things that stuck out to us that they're working on here is some sensor technology that uses your skin to send signals to your brain basically using your skin to hear the world around you. Now, uh, Facebook said that this could possibly someday let deaf people hear and even translate languages in near real time for those who can. Uh, this is something that various medical and tech researchers have been working on for decades now, and Facebook is deciding to dip its toe into this effort. The Building 8 group is also theorizing and coming up with concepts that would use electrodes in your brain that would let you type by thinking rather than moving your fingers around. And they even said that this process, if it ever can become a reality, would be actually quicker than typing with your hands. And it would allow people who are immobile to actually type as well. Now, these are a couple ideas that are definitely for the future and they didn't have any technology to show off there in person yet, uh, things that people could test out, but there are a couple ideas that are a bit more tangible and a little bit closer. Facebook demoed a camera app that it says uses artificial intelligence to blur photo backgrounds in real time, something that Apple and Google smartphone camera apps are doing through software after a photo is taken, not in real time. And Facebook is also developing a helicopter that could be, provide, could be used to provide internet access in the aftermath of disasters that knock out the internet, uh, internet infrastructure locally. So there's a lot going on here. Pretty interesting. Uh, the day one keynote was really the, uh, about what developers should spend their energy on developing now. AR, VR, chatbots. Now this stuff this is all at least 10 years away, if not further out. Um, what, what do you think? Uh, is, was, this a, was this a good collection of stuff to share with the world for a day two keynote? Yeah, I mean, I think lifting the veil on Building 8 uh, is a big deal. It was very secret there. And here's a cocktail party fact for you. Maybe you know this. Building 8 uh, is called Building 8 because of the amount of letters in Facebook. Eight, oh, I did you know. not know that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, Maybe a Jeopardy fact. If you win Jeopardy <laughs> with that question, you owe me. Um, Regina Dugan, you know, of course, was at Go Google's ATAP, which was a similar, like their version of Building 8. Now she's at Facebook. And she used to be a director of DARPA, basically the United States government, like technology skunk works division. Mm -hmm. So the she's robots. used to these kind of teams. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it's really interesting. I mean, when you first say it, it's like, oh, I'm going to hear through my skin and type with my <laughs> brain. Like you want to make fun of it. We all do. But, you know, when you think about the fact that it is really helping people who can't type, um, you know, people who, you know, just just helping people do things they couldn't. Accessibility. It's offering accessibility. And that's fantastic. And yes, it's very far into the future. 
Um, it's, I, don't, I think we're in, I heard Kara Swisher talking about this. We're in this like weird place with technology where there's the big five, you know, there's Facebook, there's Google, there's Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, um, these big companies that all started small. They were all mm-hmm. like the underdogs and now they're all big. And so we like in Silicon Valley, we like this um, David and Goliath story, but there's no, you know, there's no little guys anymore. It's only the big guys. And so we tend to hear this, like the big guys saying like, I'm going to do some things fantastic. I'm going to do you know these fantastic things and you know we tend to be like eh, you know you're of course you're facebook you can <laughs> of do anything of course you are <laughs> right well you know i'm glad you brought that up because i think part of what's happening here is that the little guys they get bought up by the big guys before they get the chance to become a household name or mm-hmm. even launch a product right so all the stuff that facebook talked about today in its day two keynote all really kind of the sort of thing you'd see in a science fiction book but these are things that companies, that researchers, that scientists have been working on for literally decades. None of this is an original idea by Facebook, but it's all the sort of thing that Google and Facebook and all these other companies are working on. And those little guys who've been working on that for a long time, some of those companies are getting bought up. And that's how companies are building up their AR divisions, building up their VR divisions. Uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, Elon Musk, he just started uh, his startup uh, uh, to focus on um, basically putting electrodes into your brain to meld AI with brain control and these sorts of things. So in some sense, that could be considered a little guy because they're a company that's just getting started, but that's coming from Elon Musk. Mm-hmm. Deep pockets, lots of resources, and a big brand name. So yeah, it's a really interesting uh, time and idea here. Um, to a certain extent, this is all kind of vaporware because there's nothing that we can touch or try or see for ourselves yet. A lot of this is super conceptual, but it's kind of exciting to see all of these big companies chasing these really big, really complicated, uh, world changing problems. If they can actually pull this sort of stuff off, it would be a lot more exciting than, you know, another Snapchat filter or something. Right. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's, it's like the moonshots take money, right? Like you couldn't just be like you and I in our garage, like let's figure out a way to hear things through our skin and, you know, let's just tinker until we do it. No, like these are big ideas that you need tons of money. So it makes sense. It's the evolution of Silicon Valley. Like, you know, they've, they've made Snapchat and, you know, Facebook in this case, now they have a ton of money to do these things, to, to change the world. Um, you know, that's a cliche, but you know, it might, But that's always the rhetoric that you hear from any of these companies is we are going to change the world. We're going to make the world better. And I got to say, while we're talking about all of these super exciting technologies, we also need to talk about the fact that Facebook, like Google and like lots of other companies out there, they pay their bills by selling ads, by Mm -hmm. collecting data on who we are and what we do, and then targeting ads against that. They're basically a data and an advertising company. But these sorts of concepts, these sorts of ideas, when they talk about them, they're there in part to kind of build up the idea that, hey, Facebook or Google or, you know, whoever is on stage talking about themselves, they want the world to see them as a company that is making the world a better place or at least trying to and creating these sorts of uh, technologies uh, that might make you feel a little bit better about sharing all of this really sensitive data with them. Because if they're going to pull this sort of stuff off, you know, they not only need to keep those other bills paid, but they have to collect this sort sort of data to build these sorts of things. These aren't the sort of things that you can, like you said, build in a garage. Mm-hmm. You have to have uh, treasure troves of information to build on. All right. Well, you know what is going to change the world? This next story. People familiar with the matter have told Eurogamer that Nintendo plans to launch an SNES Mini this year, which could explain why they chose to break the hearts of millions by discontinuing the NES Mini, the classic. The rumored console will likely be called the Nintendo Classic Mini Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Terrible name. (laughs) (laughs) And you must call it by its proper name at all times. Nintendo is apparently already in the process of developing it, according According to Eurogamer's usually reliable sources, uh, the mini NES will, and SNES will come with a retro controller and pre-installed games. And Eurogamer also says that the original SNES had better games. Is this something you would agree with? <sighs> you know, that's such a loaded question. Uh, I got to say, I really do like the NES games better than the Super Nintendo games overall. Now, there are hundreds of games for both platforms. I know I'm, at least someone's going to be pissed off with that answer, but <laughs> um, what I'd really like to see 
is all of these games, the NES games, the Super Nintendo games, come out on the Nintendo Switch. I bought the Nintendo Wii U, I bought the Nintendo Wii, and in both cases, they had a store called the Virtual Console where you could buy old games from the Nintendo, from the Super Nintendo, from the Nintendo 64, even uh, GameCube games, and even on the Wii U, Wii games. So Nintendo is really great at selling people like me the same game multiple <laughs> times. And people like me, we're suckers. We just keep buying this stuff. What I'd like to see is all of these games available on the Switch. Uh, but you know what? Th this is great to see that they're at least flirting with the idea of, of addressing those folks who don't necessarily want expensive hardware, don't want to spend 300 bucks or whatever for a system and controllers and just want to go pay 60 bucks and just get a collection of retro games that they know and love. Mm -hmm. I would like to play all these games through my skin. Through your skin. <laughs> yeah. You should talk to Facebook. Okay. <laughs> I think we need, to, we need to link Super Mario up with uh, Zuckerberg. Get yeah, them chatting. Exactly. That could be some good stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, so the, the first classic NES was $60, but you couldn't buy one. You can currently buy one it on was, eBay for was, $280. I think that might be the That's price. another problem. Nintendo doesn't make enough of their hardware mm -hmm. basically ever. And, and part of it is to generate the hype build the buzz, get the interest. It's like, oh, you got one of those. Like, it's so hard to find, you know? It creates some excitement around it. And I get that. And that's probably a business strategy, I'd hope, because if they're really that bad at getting their manufacturing partners to deliver stuff, they got some work to do. But it, it, it's, it's kind of a bummer because the NES uh, Classic was selling so well. And people really did love that thing. And 60 bucks, that's the price you'd pay for one modern game. Um, now, those uh, of us who like to hack things and, and, you know, mess around a little bit found ways to load more than 30 games on there. I think that was a bit of a ridiculous limitation. It would have been nice to see Nintendo have a retro store so that you could download the games you want. Uh, but that's another gripe. But, uh, yeah, if they're going to do this, they need, to, they, they need to come strong and they need to just build millions of these things so mm -hmm. that there, there aren't these ridiculous, you know, resellers on eBay jacking up the prices two or three times. Do you think that piracy was part of the problem that they just, that, that why they discontinued it? No, <laughs> because if anyone out there just Googles, you know, classic game ROMs or Nintendo emulators or whatever, you can find all these games on the internet. The fact of the matter is, if you want to play these games, you can put them on a Raspberry Pi on any computer that you'd like. And you've been able to do so for a really long time. Now, so far, that hasn't really hurt Nintendo's business. People like me buy those games over and over again uh, for the convenience of having it on your couch. And, you know, there's like a lot of nostalgia and love that gamers have for Nintendo as a company anyways, right? It's a company that a lot of gamers root for. Uh, so I don't really think piracy is necessarily a concern. I, I can't really tell you why they canceled uh, the, the NES Classic. I think it's a bit of a disappointment. What I would love to see is they bring these uh, games available on the Switch, then they sell a version of the Switch bundled with, you know, 30 NES games, 30 SNES games, give it some extra, you know, special Joy-Con controllers or something. Um, that would be really fun. But killing the NES Classic to bring out a Super Nintendo Classic, it seems like a little weird to me. I mean, why not sell people both? Because there are people who would buy all of them. The, the, the old systems were about the size of a VCR. These new ones are, you know like the size of a block of cheese or something. They're, they're, they're small and they're kind of adorable. And if I could have like all of the old Nintendo systems lined up on my credenza, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's that, that's the, how nerdy I am. I that's would do what the that. Credenza is for. Yeah. Well, that's what I was wondering. You know, is it just like nerd cred? Like I've got it on my credenza, um, <laughs> and you know, someone comes over and you're like, "Look at my credenza. Check it out." Um, is that is, is that, it nerd cred? I, I don't. I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> maybe to a certain extent. It depends. It depends on who your nerd friends are, right? So for for. For a certain subsect of nerds, yeah, that would be cool. The other ones would say, you know what, I didn't buy that. There are too many limitations. I uh, built my own, uh, you know, uh, and and I, th I, th I think, you know, Padre uh, was talking about this recently, how easy it is to build your own little PC that you can plug into your TV and you can load all the stuff up on or whatever. So, you know, it just depends on on, on what you're into mm -hmm. uh, and, and what you think is cool. But just the fact that you have like a, a miniature version of this console that people grew up with, that people know and love, it's, you know, kind of an adorable little box or whatever. Yeah, you know, it would be kind of fun to see it. 
All right. But I, I mean, you know, that's probably the nerdiest interior decorating you could go for. <laughs> so Nintendo's probably doing us a favor by killing these things okay, off anyways. Good. Thank so, you, Nintendo. <laughs> well, Google is looking for 10,000 people to volunteer for a study that is mixing tech, science, and health. If you volunteer, you'd be agreeing to share your genetic data with the company as it attempts to map out what a healthy human body and person is made up of. Data on your blood, your sleep, your diet, your movement, your moods, your allergies, heart functions, medical records, x-rays, imaging, all that stuff would be shared. Basically, everything that can be measured to figure out how the human body works is going to be measured and collected. Google isn't doing this alone. It's all part of an effort called Project Baseline that it's running with Duke and Stanford Universities and Google's Verily Life Sciences Division. The goal, Google, Google says, is to understand health as a means of fighting disease. It's pretty vague, but the promise is big. If you sign up, you'll have to wear various fitness trackers and health trackers and gadgets daily. You'll have to visit project doctors and personnel up to four times a year, and you'll have to complete surveys and diaries about your health and your lifestyle on a regular basis. So, Megan... Are you going to volunteer? Uh, I have already begun the process of volunteering. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I tweeted of some of uh, my experience already because, first of all, I, I like everything tracked in my life. So uh -huh. this was in, and really I'm super competitive about that. So I thought like, I just really want to see if they'll take me. <laughs> into their Am program. I healthy enough? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was really, but I only got halfway through and then I was, it's a lot of information you have to hand over to them. And it can feel a bit invasive, right? I yes. mean, you're really sharing stuff that you might not even realize was private. But then once you see the someone asking for it, you're like, whoa. That's yeah, private. Right, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's a long process. There's like 10 pages of accepting this, you know, informed consent, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I did what I normally do, like blah, 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 blah. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Then it asks you questions yeah. to check to see if you actually, actually read, read it. This. Like you get a quiz. I passed the quiz. Um, you, and then, then it got to the, really the personal information, the, you know, all, all of your medical information. And I, then, then I started to get like that sick feeling in my stomach, like this isn't fun anymore. I don't want to do it. Um, so yeah, I don't think I will. You're not going to go it. through with it. But it did remind me absolutely of Gattaca. Do you remember the movie yes, Gattaca? Yes, great movie. <laughs> With Ethan Hawke and oh, Uma Thurman. Wow. And yeah. it just, does, when you read about it, and it's people in the chat room were making fun of how creepy Facebook sounded. And like Google also sounds creepy. Like they're creating this master race <laughs> of, you know, like only the strong blonde get in. The future is creepy. <laughs> Let's just be real about it. The future is creepy. <laughs> Uh, and Ed, Edward, uh, what's his name, was also in it. Um, you know, he was the guy that, that wasn't, as Edward Norton. Edward Norton, yeah. yeah, yeah he wasn't yeah. healthy. No, no, it wasn't Edward Norton. It's, the, it's that guy. Who's that guy? What's oh, his name? I've, Jude Law. Jude Law, yeah. that's right. The, Jude for, Law. The, the original Edward Norton, Jude Law. Oh, <laughs> the, poor, the poor both of them. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. Yeah, you know, you really have to trust Google. Yeah. You, I mean, you have, I mean, you are letting Google... Not necessarily into your body, but you're letting Google basically look at your body, poke your body, see all the things, share all the data, do all, you know. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of trust. And well, I mean, they already know where we go all the time. They, they I mean, they know, know every true. place I go. They, sure. I mean, they have the possibility to know every person I talk to on email, at work. And They're not home. the only ones. Facebook's trying to get all that yeah. data everyone. Now, now, I think it's worth pointing out here that for those who do the 10,000 or so who do volunteer for this, um, they could be contributing to something great. Yes. Uh, having that much information on what health looks like, understanding how uh, the human body works uh, could be great. And it could uh, definitely lead to, to some cures for diseases, some new drugs, all these sorts of things. But at the same time, uh, this would give Google a treasure trove of data, a mountain of data that, really no other company would be able to come close to, no other tech company would be able to come close to. Um, and it's not exactly clear to me if Google would be sharing that data as openly, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the learnings as openly. Obviously, there's going to be some benefit here for the uh, medical community, but Google is competing uh, on these sorts of scientific and health discoveries against Facebook, against Apple, against 
you know, maybe someday Amazon and all these things. Mm -hmm. Well, Apple is interesting because they're, they're also doing things like this. They have health kit, they have care kit, yep. um, but they're going at it the other way, which somehow seems less creepy, like, you know, having studies, disease studies. So like if you have a heart condition, like you can participate in this. So it's, it's sort of like there's more impetus, like you are suffering from the problem. I mean, one of the questions when you go through the questionnaire is like, why are you doing this? And is it because you've suffered from an illness or someone in your family has suffered from an illness? So like they know that th that will compel people to do it. But, you know, I do just, I do, I know that Apple uses our information in some ways, but I definitely feel like I can trust them more than yeah. I can trust Google. Um, and I, I, I feel that it's not just a feeling, it's true. The way that, you know, they, what they stand for and how they, how they make their money versus how Google makes their money. So I, yeah, I don't, um. I, I think it's great, but it's, again, it's like the Facebook stuff. It's, yeah. it's like, they're not, they, they're these, the people that are leading these companies, they really believe that they can change the world. It's not, I mean, it's partly like being able to say we can change the world is going to get their investors, but they really believe this too. I think that they are really like, uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to solve disease. I'm going to make people live forever, especially people at Google. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. You know, I'm sure that they do think that they can change the world and you know what they might be able to, uh, I'll, I'll give them that credit but they're also going to be shoring up some things for their company in the process, right? Mm -hmm. They're also going to be putting themselves at a bit of a competitive advantage against uh, competitors, uh, against rivals when it comes to having the sorts of uh, health data to build products on top of. Um, so that shouldn't get lost in the conversation. Uh, but you're right. I, I think they do believe that they can, they can change it. And, you know, maybe they can. I do think that these different approaches, though, that we're seeing uh, towards health and technology from Google and, uh, and Apple, just right here, this this is very reflective of the differences of these companies themselves. Uh, there are famous uh, Steve Jobs quotes. You can find some of this stuff up on YouTube. Uh, but you know, one of the things that Steve Jobs would preach, and supposedly uh, you know Tim Cook has followed so far, is the idea of starting with the user experience, starting with the product, and then working back to find the technology to deliver that experience. Right? Where Google, they're the kind of company that just builds things out there in the wild. They're willing to make those mistakes. They're mm -hmm. willing to kind of build something just to build it, even if it doesn't have a true purpose yet. I mean, a great example of that would be Google Glass. Uh, now here we have a health study that could be tremendously beneficial, but it's a bit vague. It's like, we're just going to collect all the data and then we'll figure out what to do with it later, right? Where Apple takes that approach where they say, okay, we're going to work with doctors. What are you already doing? What are the problems you already need to solve? And let's find the technology to do it. So uh, very different philosophies, uh, but this is who these companies are. And it's exciting stuff to see. I do wonder though, if they're going to cut off at 10,000 or if they're going to take more, because I could see a lot of people getting into this not reading those terms of service agreements, uh, maybe getting a little creeped out and then trying to bail on it a yeah. few months in or maybe even a couple of years in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And they, uh, you, you do get paid. You don't get paid for filling out the survey, but you do get point. paid if you get chosen as one of the master race, according to Google. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't quite say what the, the, the compensation or the perks would be. Uh, so I'd love to have some more details on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, according to a class action lawsuit, headphone maker Bose might have been secretly spying on you. An Illinois man filed the suit claiming that the Bose wireless headphones and companion Bose Connect app violate the U.S. Wiretap Act by, quote, secretly collecting, transmitting, and disclosing its customers' private music and audio selections to third parties. The headphones cost $350, and the company reportedly does not ask permission of the user before for collecting listening habits and then selling them. Jeff John Roberts from Fortune says Bose shares its user data with a San Francisco firm called Segment that claims to slurp up all your music, radio, broadcast, podcast, and lecture choices and sell it to the highest bidder. The class action lawsuit mentions the Bose Quiet Comfort 35, the Sound Sport Wireless, Sound Sport Pulse Wireless, Quiet Control 30, Sound Link around ear wireless headphones too and sound link color too. Roberts also notes that while Bose has a privacy policy, users are not required to read or agree to it. Terrible. That might be their big mistake. Yeah. <laughs> not having yeah. a privacy policy. <laughs> this 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 sucks. Uh it's a real shame to see. I mean, you know, Bose obviously the first thing you think of when you think of them is sound. You think of speakers, you think of headphones. And uh I think for a lot of us it's not even necessarily a consideration of are they collecting data on what I'm listening to, uh, you know, and what are they doing with that data? It's just such a bummer that that 
they're not as transparent as they could have been. This is this is a clear choice. All you have to do is say, we're collecting this data. Are you good with that? Opt in, opt out, right? And and the fact of the matter is, is we're all using so much tech that shares all this data all the time. Our smartphones are doing this. Our television sets are doing this. If you have a voice controlled wireless speaker in your home, it's doing that too. Uh, all the social networking apps you're using are collecting data that pays attention to what you're doing with the product that you're using, right? People are used to sharing this sort of information. They're doing so willingly. So why not ask for permission? Uh, it's, 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 it's definitely disappointing. We'll see how this plays out as a class action lawsuit. And of course, Bose might have more to say. It might say it was a mistake or we meant to do it differently or we didn't know. So we'll see how that plays out. But uh, this is just, this is a totally preventable and solvable problem. And it's super frustrating to me that we see companies like Bose, last year Vizio was doing something similar with uh, data they're collecting on their television sets, just not be transparent about that. That is a decision and it's a choice and it's one that companies can make differently and I hope they do. Mm -hmm. the yeah. I mean, I do think data mining lawsuits are going to be the future. I mean, that's how we can as consumers say this isn't okay. Um, I might be listening to podcasts that I don't want you to know that I'm listening to for whatever reason. I mean, you know, you don't want people to know you're listening to tech news today. Shh. Actually you do tell everyone. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it, I, I don't understand why they wouldn't say, because it's not a free program. Okay, Burke, Burke has something to add. A little Burke chat here. Mm -hmm. Over and over again, same mistake. It is true. It's it's true. So it's the Federal Wiretap Act, the Illinois eavesdropping statute, and the Consumer Fraud and Invasion Privacy, invasion of Privacy Laws. So uh, I, I'm not usually a huge fan of the class action lawsuit, but in this case, I think, I mean, there might be a better way to go about this, but it's true. I mean, pay attention. We care about... Uh, our data and and uh, people should care. We should not just start getting used to the fact that, oh, okay, well, who cares? I don't, you know, like, I don't care if someone knows I'm listening to tech news today or whatever it is. Um, and we shouldn't just get used to that. We shouldn't let our children just get used to that because we, the more and more we do that, the more we like are okay with living in a pervasive surveillance state. Yeah. And that just can lead to really bad things. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy about this. Yeah, I, I you know, it, it's, it we're, I think we're at one of those moments, uh, you know, historically, where uh, a lot of these technologies are new. Uh, a lot of these companies are doing it for the first time. This isn't necessarily something that Bose did in the past. Here's a new opportunity for them, a new chance to make money, and not something that necessarily Bose can ignore, considering that everybody else is doing it, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody else can be making some money here, and if they don't, they're probably at a competitive disadvantage. But that's why it's so important for consumers, uh, for anyone uh, to speak up, like you just said, to speak up and and whatever your stance is, you know, if you like this or you don't speak up and let people know about it. Uh, and, you know, the class action lawsuit, it, it, it might be a way to tell these companies, hey, don't be a sleazeball, you know, uh, ask me permission before you you start, you know, taking this stuff here. Um, yeah, but it's it's important that we speak up because it's just going to keep going it's just going to keep accelerating mm -hmm. and uh you can't sit by the sidelines on these sort of things right yeah i mean so it's important that the the headphones themselves aren't actually listening to you it's the connect app that will help you do some certain things so yeah it's a, it's a free app that will help you i don't know switch over more easily and so that's what's collecting information about you but yeah it's um they should have asked they should have asked. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully next time they will. Mm -hmm. Well, just how easy is it to learn how to code? And can coding save us from the ever-pending robot apocalypse? We'll get to that and a lot more. But first, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage, the sponsor of this episode. When it comes to making the decision of choosing a mortgage lender, it's important to work with someone who you can trust and who has your best interest in mind. With Rocket Mortgage, you'll get a transparent online process that gives you the confidence to make an informed decision. Don't waste time searching through stacks of paperwork. With Rocket Mortgage, you can securely share your financial information and get a mortgage approval in minutes. You can even adjust the rate and the length of your loan in real time to make sure you get the mortgage solution that's right for you. And if you go on their website, it's super easy. There are sliders to check all this stuff out. It's actually a really great process. Whether you're looking to buy a home or refinance your existing mortgage, you can lift the burden of getting a home loan with Rocket Mortgage. Skip the bank 
skip the waiting and go completely online at quickenloans.com slash TNT. That's quickenloans.com slash TNT. Quicken Loans Rocket Mortgage is an equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. If you believe the United States Treasury Secretary robots won't be stealing our jobs for 50 years at least, I personally do not believe our U.S. Treasury Sec Secretary. Although it's not a magic bullet to solve the robot apocalypse, one way to possibly robot-proof your life and to boost your resume is to learn to code but what is the best way? Joining us to talk about this is Quincy Larson, founder of Free Code Camp. Welcome to the show, Quincy. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so tell us what Free Code Camp is and who is it designed for? Sure. So Free Code Camp is an open source community where people learn how to code and then they practice by building real world projects for nonprofits. Awesome. So um, you started it by yourself? Yeah, I started it in my closet in San Francisco. <laughs> I just kind of sat down and started hacking it away at it. And uh, I tweeted about it a whole lot. And I blogged about it a whole lot. And slowly but surely, people started coming. And uh, we have a very active chat room and an active forum. And I just tried to kind of stoke that flame and sustain that critical mass. And now our uh, team is, is three people. We've got a fully remote team who build this. And then we've got about 600 open source contributors and thousands of other people who are helping out by leading study groups around the world and by contributing, you know, Creative Commons assets, uh, like images and graphics and stuff, and, and just helping us improve our infrastructure and our community. So I read that you've attracted uh, over a million students. How many, uh, do you know how many have actually finished the program? So we have about 200 who've completed the entire first 1,200 hours of online coursework. So everything is basically interactive coding challenges, and people work through that. And then we have about 800 hours of building projects for nonprofits. Uh, we don't have anybody who's completed all 800 hours of that because people all get a job way before they finish that. We've had about 5,000 people who've worked through at least part of Free Code Camp who've gone out and gotten their first jobs as software engineers. Awesome. So I got to say, Quincy, I really love this idea. Uh, I learned how to do some basic web coding when I was a teenager. And I was lucky because I had people around me, uh, um, my father and, and some folks that worked with him, to actually walk me through this and take away the intimidation factor. For someone who's looking at this and sees just start coding. It's free. That can be a bit intimidating. Where should people start, and 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 how do they jump into this? If you're if maybe they're watching and they're just a little bit scared of the idea. Well, Free Code Camp is designed with adult learners in mind, and the assumption is that people have not coded a day in their life before. Now, at the same time, Free Code Camp is completely self-paced. And you can jump around in the curriculum. So if you have some more, if you don't need to learn HTML, if you learned that uh, a long time ago and you just want to jump straight to learning more advanced JavaScript or Node.js or React, you can just jump right ahead to that. And uh, we offer a bunch of different uh, free certificates. And if you complete those certificates, you can, you can put those on your LinkedIn um, or your resume. And um, basically to... In order to obtain those certificates, you just need to complete a few key challenges. You don't actually need to complete everything. So it's really designed with flexibility at the forefront. Uh, that said, again, totally fine if you've never coded a day in your life. About two thirds of people who joined Free Code Camp, they hadn't coded before they started. Is it appropriate for someone who is working a full time job? Yeah. It, so because it's completely self paced, um, you can literally dive in and everything runs in the browser too. So you, we have people who work through it on their phones, people who work through it in a public library, depending on their availability, just wherever you can hop on a computer, if there's a browser, you can work through it. And almost everything is like a really small challenge that you can do in like two or three minutes. So we've just got hundreds of these interactive coding challenges. And if you work through those, um, then you can just kind of jump in as time permits. 
Awesome. So it seems like there's a, a real focus uh, on building community, maintaining community here on, on Free Code Camp. Uh, on the website, it mentions different things like meeting up with coders in your city, uh, speaking with folks in real time from community chat rooms. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of, of, of why that community exists and, and, and how people tap into it to actually meet up with people local and why, would, why they would even would want to? Yeah, well, one of the biggest challenges when you're learning something as large and ambiguous as software development is that it's hard and it's hard to stay motivated. There are so many different things that can happen. Life can get in the way or you can just really get stuck and not be able to progress um, and bang your head on your desk for you know, 20, 30 minutes. And, and at some point, you're going to want to be able to reach out to other people, not just for technical help, like people can help you solve the coding challenge or they can help you pinpoint a bug in your code, but also for the moral support. And the best way to continue progressing through this process of, of learning to code is to hang out with other people who code because th those people keep you pumped and, and moving forward. It's, it's not easy to learn to code. Um, if anybody says it's easy, they're probably a marketer. Um, <laughs> in real life, it takes thousands of hours to get good at it. And we think that with about 12, 1,200 to 2,000 hours worth of uh, coding practice, which is what Free Code Camp provides, um, you can go out and get your first job and then you can basically just get paid to learn to code because it's gonna take you years to really get up there uh, to the level that you're able to confidently and competently build robust software. So, so you mentioned putting uh, certificates on your LinkedIn profile. Are those? Are you talking about the same certificates that people pay thousands of dollars to get? So, uh, there are several different kinds of certificates. There are kinds where it's like a butt in the seat type certificate, where I attended this um, this workshop um, for twenty weekends in a row, and I got this certificate. So things like that. And and yeah, those generally cost money. And then there are also certificates that are based purely on performance and like actually completing a task, sitting down and working through uh, a, a series of uh, deterministically tested coding challenges, for example, which is what Free Code Camp is. So uh, yeah, the, I mean, they're completely free. And a lot of people are surprised because, you know, Coursera and edX and a lot of these other programs will charge for certificates. But but that's something like we want Free Code Camp to be completely free. Uh, we're a nonprofit and our goal is to make learning as accessible to everyone, regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless of whether they even have a credit card. And a lot of people out in, uh, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of people in South Asia don't even have the resources to to pay like a dollar or two for a certificate. Um, they're half the world lives off of two dollars a day, so we want to be accessible to all those people. And actually, a large percentage of the people who use Free Code Camp are, you know, from those countries. So, so how can it be free? Is it um, is it because of the community? Um, how do you do it? So we have a team of just three people, and we have like extremely efficient. Um, servers that we're constantly tuning to get really good performance. Like we're serious about being very capital efficient and we're donor supported nonprofit. So uh, the donations that we're able to uh, take in from people in the community who are either using Free Code Camp or who want to support uh, open source learning, uh, we're able to go a long way with that. So programming, coding, uh, this is really the sort of thing that you never stop learning. It's you're never just like I'm done. I know how to code now. I mean, there's always new stuff to do, new languages. Uh, languages develop in advance over time. Um, how how is this going to grow? Are you going to add things like Go and Python and PHP and Swift and all these different languages that come up, or are you really kind of focused on these like foundational uh, uh, things like HTML and JavaScript and D3? So our goal is to have a single curriculum that everybody can work through that's it's kind of like going up the Appalachian Trail. You can look back and you can see people right behind you going through the exact same thing you did. It makes it really easy for people to help one another and it also creates this kind of uh, common rite of passage. Um, and by having it be very narrow and, and linear, um, that also removes a lot of the ambiguity. 
So our, our core curriculum is just full stack JavaScript. It's using Node.js. You literally just use JavaScript. You don't need to use Python or Java or any of the other languages. And you can certainly do that. Like all of our projects are language agnostic. So if you want to use those tools, you can. We definitely plan to create interactive coding tutorials for all of those languages you just mentioned. But one thing that we want to do is, is keep it focused. Now, already we have a ton of articles. We have a ton of videos on a wide variety of different programming languages, a wide variety of different tools for uh, running servers and everything like that. Um, and we publish new videos and we publish new articles every day. Awesome. This is so great. And so you also, you are a prolific writer on, on Medium and uh, also uh, Free Code Camp has a lot of other writers. Uh, what's going on there? Do you have, uh, is it is it sort of like a magazine on Medium? Yeah. So Medium has what are called publications. And basically anybody who writes on Medium can get syndicated in one of the publications. Free Code Camp is the fifth largest publication on Medium. And uh, we are the largest technical publication that's focused on technology and, and programming. And we publish several articles a day uh, about topics related to primarily software development, design, and data science. So those are our three kind of core topics. And, and we'll also publish, if people build like an open source library that they want to publicize, uh, we can serve as a, a platform for helping publicize that. So I'm the... I'm the only editor for that publication, so I spend a good chunk of my day uh, reviewing all the submissions and, and trying my best to make sure that everything we publish is worthy of our readers' time. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, one of the ways I found you was I, you had, Quincy has a great piece on how to find people in your area to uh, code with. So you can check that out on Medium. Quincy is a teacher, a writer, an editor. You can find him on Twitter, Medium, and GitHub. On Medium and GitHub, he's qu at Quincy Larson. On Twitter, he is Osia, O-S-S-I-A. -S -S Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Take care. Well, we really love our audience here at Twit, and this is just one of the millions of reasons why we got a voicemail about cockroaches. So earlier this week, Jason and Megan filled you in on the fact that roaches love to live, poop, and reproduce inside of video game consoles like the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One. Well, that isn't the only place you can find roaches. Brian, roll the tape. <laughs> AT&T crew, uh, didn't you have uh, pets when you were growing up? Um... Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's really hard to avoid uh, cockroaches in a pet situation because the water bowls attract pets, the food bowls attract pets, them eating snacks around the house attracts pets, uh, not to mention the fact that, uh, that if you live in an apartment complex or houses that are too close, even if you keep a clean place, your neighbors can be dirty enough that you'll have a roach infestation uh, because they'll just wander over because of the small gap between y'all. So I, I, I really don't believe it's just about keeping your house clean. I think there's extra implications. Uh, that is Joe's apartment, by the way. Yeah. Um, not the, 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 the movie. Yeah, not a not person the movie, named not, Joe. The, not the guy that just called in <laughs> his apartment. But it's true. Yeah, we both had the same experience growing up. Roaches, even though we kept a clean house and, uh, you know, our mothers kept a clean house and cleaned up after cooking. Uh, so, yeah, you can have roaches. Yeah, there are many, many factors as to why you can have roaches. Uh, and if you have video game consoles and you have roaches, you probably have some roaches in your video game console. So <laughs> tying that all back together. But we love the feedback. Uh, <laughs> great, uh, a great contribution to the conversation. Uh, I wonder where the, the roach talk will go next, really. Yeah, I really do, too. TNT's <laughs> yeah, yeah. fan of the day is Ancient T, Father and Geek, who sent us a self-portrait of his daily morning commute and how he listens to TNT. And apparently his car levitates as he listens. That or he's going over a jump. He's like, yeah, you know. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Show us how you watch or listen to TNT, record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup, post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, Facebook. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we will find it. Microsoft is killing Wonderlust, or Wonderlist, <laughs> Wonderlist, <laughs> the beloved to-do list app that it bought a couple of years ago. The reason? Well, it's built a new to-do app called To-Do. Will it be as good? We haven't had a chance to try it out yet. But if you are a Wonderlist fan, it's worth noting that the Wonderlist team 
built the to-do app since Microsoft bought that team. So it should share some of the sensibilities while also integrating better into Microsoft's Office Apps suite. Microsoft said that a preview version of To-Do will be available for the web, iPhones, Android phones, and Windows phones today. Mac and iPad versions of the app, as well as things like Amazon Echo features, are still a few months away. So what do you think? Uh, you know, Microsoft does a good job of buying startups and then kind of killing the, those core products. They're not the only ones. Lots of companies do this. Apple, Google, Facebook, they all do it. But um, this is kind of a beloved app. It has yeah. its own niche cult following. Mm -hmm. Well, as was Accompli was a beloved email app and they turned that into Outlook for yep. iOS and um, and I guess Android as well. Yeah. And that's great. I mean, it's very useful. I don't use it anymore. But, um, and just because I find Google Inbox to be the easiest email program. But I do like Wonderlist and... Yeah. So I, and it looked good. That video looked kind looks of like, promising. yeah, yeah does, the so. UI looks nice and clean and simple. I guess to a certain extent, it probably doesn't matter what the app is called as long as it works and does what it needs to do. But it is a little bit of a bummer to see such a cool brand uh, that a small startup built on its own mm -hmm. without the resources of a Microsoft or an Apple or a Facebook or anybody else just get thrown away like that. But hey, you know, to do, you know what the app's going to do once you read the name of that mm -hmm. thing. So mm -hmm. I guess there's no ambiguity there. Well, it's not going to do the things for you is the problem. I really wanted an app that would do all the things. Do all the things. Yeah, do them for me. Yeah, well, you know, once we get to that, uh, once the robots take over yeah. the future. <laughs> They'll change the laundry, <laughs> fold the laundry, put it away. There you go. Clean it's the floor. Probably only a matter of time. Well, tomorrow's guest will be Rolf Winkler from the Wall Street Journal. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. And you can be a part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv or leaving us a short voicemail, as you heard earlier, at 260-TNT-SHOW. You can also hit us up on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. Go vote for Triangulation in the Webby Awards. Go do that. You only have one more day. The last day is Thursday. Uh, just look up Webby's. Look up, go to my Twitter, go to Leo's Twitter, go to twit.tv. You'll see the link to, to vote and vote. And only vote once because otherwise it's not We're not close. Fair. We're close. It's, we it's, close. It's, it's almost one. Go do it's, it. It's, 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 it's within reach. We yes. got to do it. Yeah, got to do there it. There we go. Uh, yeah, so go vote. It appears that, yes, we are still... Uh, yeah. Let's and, get and, this win. And the Motherboard podcast this week was called Vote for Motherboard. So I think that <laughs> we're not the only ones promoting Shamelessly ourselves. Shamelessly plugging. Yes. Yeah. Uh, also go to the subreddit technewstoday.reddit.com to uh, yeah, up, up vote some stories or downvote some stories and find all the ways to subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash TNT. And if you want to tweet at me, I'm at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Nate OG. Thanks to our technical director, Brian. Burke for helping out in the studio, Victor for editing the show, and thank you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you here tomorrow. You high five? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs>Want to do that again? Victor <laughs> instead of Kevin. Victor instead of Kevin. Victor? <laughs> Victor? Question mark? Victor. 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 Exclamation point. Sorry, Victor.